So, hello everyone. I'm really excited to talk to you today about uh, some really exciting new concepts in canine epilepsy management. Um, I think uh, over the last couple of years, um, mainly out of frustration, we, we started to develop new um, treatment strategies and we also realized that epilepsy is far more than seizures and epilepsy is far more, uh, I mean epilepsy management is far more than drugs. Like for any, any talk I give nowadays, um, it's obviously I have some financial disclosures uh, to make and depending on which country uh, you listen in, um, obviously make sure what I will mention a couple of drugs that you obviously uh, um, look after the legal framework in that country. And people heard my talks before, um, and I often start with, with a dog, which is very close to my heart, because it was my own dog. Uh, she, uh, her name is Beauty, um, and actually it was Beauty. Um, she was at the end 17 years of age, and she had um, epilepsy since she was four years of age. And she taught me a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, I use her because I think one of the challenges with this disease, it's a very emotional disease, and it really having had a pet with epilepsy can, can teach you a lot of tricks to better manage this disease. And one of the things um, Beauty had, and not a lot of people know, uh, and you will know in a second, was that she always had a little bit of gastrointestinal disturbances. She was never 100% right. And I, I ignored that because I never thought there is any connection between epilepsy and, and the gut. Um, but, you know, as more evidence is, is uh, surfacing, I, I really realized that there has to be more than that. Um, one of the things I, I often mention is uh, the spaghetti analogy, um, and um, what is it about the spaghetti? I, I asked the question to the audience, and I, this talk unfortunately is not interactive, but you know, I asked the question, is, um, which, which water boils quicker? The, the one where you add in salt before you uh, put the kettle on the uh, hob, or the one um, which boils and then you uh, add the salt later? I think there's no question that um, the water can boil. I'm sure everyone is agree with that. So if you put a kettle you know, on, an, on, on the hub, then obviously the water will boil. But the thing is, if you add a little bit of salt, uh, then you can actually speed up the process. And the same happens in the brain. So it's no question that every brain can seizure. Your brain can seizure. And it is even possible that a lot of people who are listening to this talk will have had one seizure in their life and they will have never noticed it. Yeah? What is happening is that the pathology, and you know there's a lot of pathologies which can cause seizures, either extracranially or intracranially, they will lower the threshold and make it more likely for the, the water to boil or for your brain to seizure. And the same applies actually to the opposite, right? We are using treatment to dampen down this activity, mainly depressing this activity, and there's a lot of factors which can actually help you dampen down this activity. And, uh, and, and I will show you quite a few of them, and one of them is obviously diet. The, um, we talk mainly in this talk about idiopathic epilepsy. Idiopathic epilepsy is, is a diagnosis of exclusion, as you know. Um, you rule out any extra cranial causes which cause uh, seizures or intoxications, and you rule out any intracranial causes. However, even if you can't see a pathology, it doesn't mean it's the same disease. Right? It's a bucket diagnosis. So idiopathic epilepsy has a big variety. And that's why you will see there are some dogs which respond beautifully to medications, others don't. Some might respond beautifully to uh, diet changes and others don't. So it's really, um, just think about it when you, when you treat them. Yes, we treat them very similarly, but I think you have to individualize more the management of those patients. Uh, we, we repeated actually this exercise just recently. We we obviously quite lazy, right? We uh, don't publish a lot, and uh, uh, I'm joking aside, no. But but you know, one of the things we did is we we ask uh, uh, first opinion vets, uh, specialists, and also owners. And this is now from owners what is the next thing you want us to develop, right? And this uh, work is already a couple of years old. Uh, we just repeated it now. I'm, I'm writing it uh, up now for publication. And when you ask actually owners, what is the things you would like us to develop and change in the epilepsy uh, research, um, then obviously, yes, drugs are coming up there. Um, uh, people will talk about homeopathies. They will talk about cannabis like everyone. But really important thing, non-drug management trigger factors. Uh, we don't have enough time today. Perhaps next time we can talk about that. 
because we did some really great work on that, and diet and vet education. So diet features very highly. And actually the only reason why I started this whole research was because I was speaking to um, bulldog owners, English bulldog owners, and they were telling me that certain diets stopped the seizure activity. And I said, ah, don't, yeah. And, and then you go to speak to other breeders, and they always say that uh, diets make the difference. And I said, like, okay, let's stop this, and let's put a bit of science behind this. And then we started to, to work on, on diets. Days when I manage an epileptic uh, patient, I have a more holistic approach. I look at the whole package. I look, can I remove any trigger factors? Can I reduce uh, the stress factors? Can I change the lifestyle? Um, do I need anti epileptic drugs? And then which ones? Can I modify the nutrition and balance the nutrition? And then hopefully I will get some epilepsy control. Uh, people who have been in the UK, Tesco has a, um, a slogan. Tesco is a supermarket chain and they say every little helps. And the same is actually for epilepsy. It's not just giving them a pill and then it's all good, right? You need to think about the package, the owner, the dog. There's some really great work on animal, uh, uh, human-animal bond and how that influences stress factors. So you need to take the whole person with the, with a, with a pet into your team and manage them. This is what I really like. Um, this is a, um, a, a drawing from Lennox and Lennox, and he says in a different way, but it gives you the same picture. So he compares that um, seizure activity is, is, like, is like a river uh, which spills over the riverbed, right? So what we are doing is we are building up the riverbed or we are lowering the water. And then he com obviously uh, compares that uh, if you have multiple streams coming together, then you can develop this water. So he, at that time already, and this is 1960, they said, hey, look, it's not just the one pathology. It's probably multiple factors which lower the seizure threshold, giving you more stream, and then what we need to do is we need to build up this riverbed to make it less likely for the overflow for the seizure to actually threshold. Okay? So it's the same, same approach has been done for a long time, but I think we got very stuck to the only using drugs. Um, uh, a publication uh, we wrote in Veterinary Record. Uh, I will show you again later the citations for that. Um, and there we highlighted the fact that it really needs to be not only about seizure control but also of quality of life. Think about the whole package and the environment. I think you got the picture. We have in our arsenal in general, um, yes, um, anti-seizure medication is probably still the backbone and we, we should never ignore that and it's, it's still... Uh, carries us, but um, diets and lifestyle um, uh, is, is, are important factors which will play a role. Um, it also plays a role that um, surgery and um, one of the things um, we are working on is deep brain stimulation. So there are different modalities you can now use to manage um, epilepsy. Uh, to show the drugs because it's just important. So from AC, we have a consensus statement from, uh, published in JVIM a couple of years ago. We agreed that for the routine treatment, phenobarbital or imipitoin uh, have a good level of evidence and, and should probably be used first line and then uh, followed by bromide and so on. So at the end of the day, I just don't want that you go walk away and say, oh, you know, a diet alone will, will fix it. Sometimes it might, but most of the times you need to have also some drugs. The other thing um, is, is, you know, Epilepsy is defined by having two seizures at least 24 hours apart. And we focus a lot on the seizures, right, on the seizure frequency. But actually during a seizure, you know, you, you might not be conscious, you, you are not there. But what's happening in between the seizure activity might be even more important. And when you look at quality of life, uh, uh, quality of life studies where you look at what owners notice. So what owners really can cope with for their own quality of life is if they can watch a dog which is a toxic um, and is sedated. It's, it's a, for the dog's quality of life, the main one is if you have polypharmacy, so you have multiple drugs on board, and if they have a high seizure frequency. Okay? So you just think about these factors as well. So probably sometimes it's better to not use too many drugs, but also use other modalities um, and to just find the right balance for that individual patient. In recent years, and, and you understand later when we talk about diet why this is also important, we looked a lot more at changes other than just the seizures. So seizures define the epilepsy. 
However, um, it is that epilepsy is a brain disease and there are other behavioral comorbidities which are also associated with that. So what happens in this period um, between, uh, between the seizures? And when you ask uh, patients uh, what else is epilepsy apart from seizure activity, then they will come up with a lot of things you would have never considered as a vet, right? They will say, you know, uh, it's confusion, it's side effects, I, I have an impulsivity problem, I have an ADHD type of um, problem, I have anxiety, I'm depressed, I'm tired, I'm, my learning is slowed down. And then when you, when you talk to those patients, and I've, done, I've spoken to a lot of human patients, they said, like, actually, you know, I can cope with those seizures because they happen, you know, every, every three months or so, and that's okay. But the side effects of the drugs and also actually the, the, my change in behavior between, uh, I, I can't cope with that. So I think we can do better than that. And it's an area which, which is heavily explored at the moment. We know for a very long time, so Hippocrates already said, the melancholics ought to become epileptics. And epileptics become uh, also melancholics. And when you look then in the literature, then um, there was a famous psychiatrist from Queen's Square uh, in London, and what, what they showed is that there's a, a, a bidirectional relationship. So people who have depression are more likely to develop epilepsy, and people who have epilepsy are more likely to develop depression. And I've just shown you some, some numbers down here. So in epilepsy patients, um, depression is quite high compared to the general population, and anxiety disorder, it's the same story, right? When we started to look in 2011, no one, no one actually believed us, right? Everyone said, oh, my God, this is not, not true. You know, the only thing what they have is seizures. But actually, a lot of those dogs, they get quite anxious. And when you ask and talk to the owners, they say, yeah, they're more clingy, they're more with us, they don't want to leave us, they start suddenly biting other dogs away. So there's a lot. And actually, when you look at the stats, it was 71%. So three out of four dogs had some behavior changes inter Italy, which were not associated with the seizure activity. Right? Look at what, what was changed. Um, they became, like I said, more fearful, mainly to other surroundings, unfamiliar dogs, unfamiliar people. They might have even become aggressive to them um, and, and had a change in their perception. And now, in the last couple of years, you see papers popping out left, right, and center. Yeah? There, here is a beautiful study from Luisa de Rizio, which I have here a nice picture of her. Um, uh, where she also found in Lagota Romano exactly the same thing what we did find. The only thing is that she couldn't find the defensive aggression. And, and there are about quite a few papers which show you the same thing. So there's more and more evidence about that there is really behavior changes, and especially in anxiety, so they get more anxious. The other thing, and this is really interesting because, and I'll show you the publication later, because we found it at the same time. And I always compare science with a, with a mosaic picture. People often think about one study is like, you know, the truth, but it's not. It's actually when you have multiple studies confirming the same results. Yeah? And, um, and the reason for that is because we, we had a canine epilepsy center at the Royal Vet College, and I saw a lot of patients there, and you know they were always very special. And and then I got uh, a very 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 good uh, uh, colleague of mine. She was my postdoc now. She's a lecturer at the RVC, um, and and she she said, Holger, you know, I I think anxiousness is not the right thing for these dogs. They were like border collies and German shepherds. They were hyper hyper hyper. And she said, I think actually they have problems with the impulsivity control. You know, they are like 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 an attention deficit hyperactivity uh, disorder. And I say, are you sure? Yeah. And then, so we looked into measuring these and we found something. And I was like, ah, oh, okay. And then the interesting thing is um, here, uh, it's a paper what Taya wrote from, from Helsinki, from Finland. She looked at a, at a certain breed which have a childhood um, epilepsy, the Lagotto Romaniolum. And uh, interesting is there's a benign epilepsy syndrome because they grow out and, and, and out of their seizures. So when they're one year, two years, they, they have no seizures anymore, right? But then she looked at them at five, six years of age and suddenly found that they still had problems with their behavior. They had changes in their behavior. So you can see that it actually it's a lot more than just the seizure disorders. And I'm, I'm sure um, people who have known me, uh, I'm still in my heart 22 years of age, but when you look at your physique, you are changing. But when does actually normal become abnormal? When is that stage come that you, know, um, uh, you change to be abnormal? And when, when you look at uh, cognition especially.
So um, there are a lot of um, papers out there. So like I said, the first comorbidity, behavior, ADHD, and anxiety. But the other one is, are there also problems with your cognition. And exactly the same happens there. You have a bidirectional relationship again. You get some Alzheimer pathology, vascular stress, and epilepsy as well. And it is not, and one has to be really crystal clear about this, it's not that people who have epilepsy are, are, are not as smart or are more stupid. That's not the case. However, if they have another um, uh, change in, in, their, in their cognition, then it just pushes them over the edge, right? Um, and this is my, when it becomes normal, abnormal, your clinical significant levels, right? And then suddenly people realize you have a problem with your cognition. In dogs, it's a bit more tricky to find, and there's some scoring, but this, again, goes over the lecture today. But what is the interesting thing is that it looks like that epilepsy is just changing a little the curve. It's just pushing the curve a little bit in the other direction. So if you are then suddenly becoming abnormal, you're becoming even more abnormal. Yeah, and if the same happens in dogs, so we did a really big study. We had four and a half thousand dogs in this study, and um, uh, and actually we didn't focus on epilepsy. We said, okay, we want to have all dogs which are adult, and want to see, you know, um, what is actually associated with the decrease in trainability. So they are not as easy to learn tricks. Yeah. Um, and what we found is that two things modeled when the dogs were older, so when they were older than 12 years of age, and the idiopathic epilepsy. So those two, dog, uh, two uh, items, those two factors actually modeled, which is quite an, an interesting thing. So it looked like that epilepsy, as canine cognitive dysfunction probably, is changing your trainability. Okay? The other thing is what was also crystal clear, and that's really important again when you speak to those owners, is that a reward-based system kept dogs going f longer. So negative uh, uh, punishment um, and was not as good as, as a positive reward system and training. So you actually guys listening now to me today, you know, it's exactly the right thing. You're learning something as more we do, as longer we keep our, our compliance and, and stay normal and, and not become abnormal. The other thing is drugs had a big influence, right? So polytherapy, Zonisamide or potassium bromide uh, were the ones which modeled in this multivariate statistic model and had a change in trainability. We look at a, a, a harder measure, so actually look at, okay, I'm not looking at how well you train, but actually I look even if you have cognitive dysfunction. Uh, and, and, and there are some nice scores for uh, canine cognitive dysfunction when, uh, which, which around you know, uh, one in three dogs, around 12, and two out of three dogs when they're around 14, 15, will have cognitive dysfunction. Um, and, and when we use those scoring system, again, epilepsy modeled, right? So you have a higher likelihood when you have epilepsy that you also will have uh, cognitive dysfunction. Also, obviously, age makes sense and the training history. Um, 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 yeah, exactly. The is, um, which you will also have seen before, is that if you have a high uh, seizuring frequency or a cluster seizure, so, so a higher density is probably the best way to say it, a higher density of seizure activity, then you will have also more cognitive uh, abnormalities and the same also for the other behavior abnormalities. We also looked at um, other cognition tests. We do, used a, a, a spatial memory test and found that dogs were still able, when they had um, um, epilepsy, to, rem to kind of uh, do some problem-solving tasks. However, the spatial memory was impaired. So we have now multiple studies which all confirm the same thing, that also uh, your cognition is impaired. So you don't only have behavior abnormalities, it's also cognition and in the interictal period. How can we all explain this, right? Um, so I have now two MRI slides, uh, uh, pictures here um, from the same dog um, two years apart. This dog was uh, drug refractory, yeah? And what you can probably see, and I'm not sure if you can see my, my arrow here, is that um, in the ventral part of the hippocampus area, there's a bit of hypersintensity, yeah? so it's more whitish in that area. And two years later, this area is actually missing, right? So what is happening is there's a certain area of the brain which um, uh, gets affected by this, and this is in the limbic system, which also influences not only seizure activity, but also your behavior profile. And the uh, hippocampus is often associated with that, which is also part of your cognition process. And the interesting thing is that we know now that these areas of the brain, similar to an aging brain, will change the way they metabolize glucose. 
And one of the ideas is if we would give them something else than, than sugar um, um, in the interactive period, perhaps the brain would function in that area better, right? So you are, um, it, it, the, the, the brain has an altered glucose metabolism. So perhaps another energy source would actually help um, that area. Um, we all know, obviously, glucose is essential, but what a lot of people probably don't, don't know is as more you age, as less glucose dependent is your brain metabolism, and the same happens with epilepsy. And this is just highlighting this again in, in cognitive dysfunction. And that's, that's why we all got interested in, in, in looking at diet. And there was a, a really interesting publication came out where they used medium chain uh, triglycerides. Um, and uh, I will talk about this in more detail in a second. Um, and elderly beagles suddenly were uh, had more cognitive um, capabilities. They, they improved in their trainability, so to speak, right? So we thought like, okay, so why, why would this work in uh, aging dogs? Could it not also work in dogs with epilepsy? And a couple of things just now about diet and the role of diet in, in, in epilepsy in general, right? We are going back to cooking spaghetti, right? You guys all you all know that when you change the salt content of your food, you will also change the potassium bromide level in your blood. Yeah, the bromide level directly correlates with the chloride level. Yeah, so if you have, and the reason potassium bromide as sodium chloride is a salt, right? And when you change that, then you will alter also the serum concentration of the drug, and then it might not alter. The classic one in the beach, and they drink a little salt water, suddenly they don't, those dogs with epilepsy don't get enough bromide taken up, and they might even get it replaced by chloride, and they start seizuring again, right? So we already know that, yeah, the salt content sometimes can influence my, my, my drug treatment, yeah? Um, the other thing is we, we looked now in more fundamental way of what are owners doing and what treatments do they give um, to the patients. And I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure how well this comes out. And we wanted to see what is the, what is, how, how, how many people actually are changing the diet. And interestingly, two out of th three people were already changed the diet when the dog was epilepsy. And the reason why they did it, so we didn't ask, you know, did it work or not? We just asked, why did you do it? And the reason why they did it is to protect the brain, obviously, to also improve the seizure control, which I thought interesting, and also to alter those behavior abnormalities. They felt that changing the diet improved also uh, behavior abnormalities. Uh, at what did they give? Um, then it's, it's mainly uh, um, either they, uh, um, as a medium chain triglycerides already, people are often uh, um, giving, I mean, this was already associated after our first publication, so probably a lot of owners are already supplying that. Uh, people were also giving fish oil, so omega-3 fatty acids, and, um, and uh, some cannabis oil. Yeah? But a lot of people are already working with that because they think that there might be an improvement. When you look now at the classic ketogenic diet, so the idea that obviously glucose metabolism in the brain is altered and I need to change something, uh, give them another uh, um, alternative uh, source of energy, um, People have, in, in, in people now, have used um, the classic one, high-fat diets. And when you give them high-fat, low-carb, low-protein, you will have a lot of uh, um, ketone bodies. And because of that, of having a lot of ketone bodies, they called it a ketogenic diet. They found in children, uh, when they were starving or had this high-fat diet, that they suddenly improved in their seizure control. Why, why children only? The reason is, if you give someone uh, such a diet, it's, it's very difficult to keep them on it if they're an adult because you know, they just get such a high craving for sugar. Um, but it had a good efficacy. When you get why and how does it work, uh, we talked about the, the glucose uh, 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 exchange, giving a different energy source um, for that and improve mitochondrial um, activity and also potentially a direct inhibition of uh, glutamatergic uh, synaptic transmission. And we talk about this in a second uh, in a lot more detail. Um, you look at what happened in veterinary medicine. There was mainly one study which never got published, partly, but was presented at ACIM. 
um, where in 2005, where they tried one of these um, high-fat uh, ketogenic diet, and, and as you all know, dogs are wolves, and uh, or at least they, they used to be wolves, and they, it's very difficult to get them really in a ketotic state, right? Um, and the other problem what they what they ran into was that when they were, were giving that. Um, quite this high fat diet, quite a few of them uh, develop pancreatitis. As we know, when you give uh, phenobarbital and potassium bromide uh, to dogs, sometimes they can get pancreatitis, and if you give those refractory dogs a high fat diet, then it will just blow the pancreas and, and you have a problem, right? So actually, um, that could not be the way forward, and they also um, stopped it, but it looked like that from a seizure control point of view, that it, it could be promising. Uh, so. We were obviously on, on this journey of looking at different uh, diet alterations. And the other thing what, what someone published just before we started the study, which you can also see here um, from Nicholas Granger, is they compared uh, giving fish oils or omega-3 fatty enriched uh, food compared to olive oil, and they couldn't find a difference. So we thought, mm, perhaps the MCT idea, which are the medium chain to glycerite idea, might be a really good option. Um, this is the publication I mentioned before for the cognition part, and um, this is study. So what are actually medium chain uh, triglycerides? And they are quite cool because what they do is, I mean, they are obviously medium length, right? They, they are not very short, they are not very long, they are middle sized. Um, and these, uh, these C8 to C12, or mainly C8 and C10 is actually the, the main ones, they get metabolized very quickly into, uh, they have a very high ketogenic yield. You get a very fast uh, ketone increase. Yeah, and um, the other uh, positive thing on it is um, um, you don't get all the issues with pancreatitis and so on, and um, you also have a better palatability than giving a high-fat diet. So a high-fat diet also for a dog, you know, is very difficult to maintain. So in this first trial, and I have now, we have quite a few trials I would like to mention today, what we wanted to look at dogs which generally did not respond to treatment, right? They had to have three or more, and a lot of them had a lot more seizures than that in the last three months. Um, they had to be at least on one antiepileptic drug, um, chronically treated, and what we then did is that we had one cohort start on the placebo, the other cohort start on the medium chain to visualize, and then we swapped um, after three months, and they got the, the other. So yeah, placebo, obviously, then the MCT, and the MCT, then the placebo. Yeah? So we could then compare the three months to the three months and see if there's a difference uh, uh, looking at it in a prospective manner. And dogs we included, they have various breeds. Um, as always, it's bad to be male, and the same uh, happens in this case. Uh, we had uh, um, 15 male dogs. Uh, being actually male is a, um, it's a risk factor for having difficult to control um, epilepsy. And um, what you also can see is that um, we all of these dogs received obviously phenobarbital. Most of them also had potassium bromide and uh, um, a third antiepileptic drug. So they were very difficult to control epileptic uh, seizure patients. And we looked when we, when we unblinded, so this was all, you know, uh, actually it was triple blind, we said double blinded, but also the statistician didn't know uh, which one was the effective proof and which one not. Um, we, we found that there was a, a decrease in seizure frequency overall. Yeah? When you look now, and uh, here in blue it's highlighted the ones which, which decrease, uh, the red ones are the ones which are, uh, uh, stay the same or increase. Um, you can see that the majority of dogs already had a response. When you look at the overall effect, it looks quite small. However, however, um, when you look at how many dogs actually became seizure-free, then it becomes quite remarkable. So you have three dogs which became seizure-free, and seven additional ones were more than 50% uh, reduction in seizure frequency. So we had around 48%, so half of the, po uh, of the population um, did respond really well. And this is very similar as if you would have done now giving an, another antibiotic drug. So it's quite a remarkable uh, response rate for some dogs, not all. 
when you add um, seizure days, so you could on the one hand side say, okay, you know, uh, um, it could have been that I only reduced the number of cluster seizures. Cluster seizures means you have more than one seizure a day, um, but actually it didn't reduce the, you know, how many they, days of seizure activity they had. Also there we could actually see a, a decrease in seizure uh, day frequency, which was significant. And the most interesting thing is when you do this, and we have now doing a couple of uh, uh, randomized controlled trials, um, is um, when you're unblind, because one of the worries we obviously had was when we are, when we are giving, uh, obviously now, a, a, a food, like with the broma, potassium bromide, that we might just change the serum concentration of the drug, right? And actually, what happened is there was no difference. So when we are unblinded and we compared the serum concentration of, of phenobarbital and potassium bromide, there was no difference. So it, you could not explain the improvement by um, the serum concentration change, yeah, because there was none. So overall, a uh, really good result in 48% of the dogs. Um, and the other thing is, like I mentioned already before, uh, one of the ketone bodies, which, which you have all probably already measured before in your practice, is, is better hydroxybutyrate. Um, uh, did increase, um, but it, it, the dogs are far from being ketotic. Yeah, and we talk a little bit more about when we talk about how this actually might work. Um, it, it becomes a bit more clear. Like I said before, you know, um, if you have one puzzle piece, so you have one little cobble, uh, you don't get a whole mosaic picture, right? So we, we repeated a study where uh, in this time, in the first study, we had 5.5% of MCTs included in the diet. And now in this one, we added oil over the diet. Um, um, and when we did that uh, in a, in a multi-center approach, uh, we could again replicate the first result. Um, we re had again a significant decrease in uh, seizure frequency in the dogs which received MCT. And again, there were certain individuals who were better than others. So there are some dogs which is, yeah, it, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, just go back. Since, um, I can't go back. It's fine. Um, which are improvement just a lot better than, than others. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing is, what is really interesting is when you look at the serum concentration, there was actually an 8% decrease in the phytobarbital serum concentration in the effective group, right? So what happened is um, what we think is that the liver probably metabolized uh, more efficiently and there was a, a, a clear improvement uh, uh, from a clearance point of view. So you could not explain, on the other hand, the effect of the medium chain fatty acids, right? So, um, uh, so there was no increase in the phenobarbital, it was actually decreased, and still the dogs were better. So we could, I think the bottom line is we could replicate the first study uh, by doing a very, very similar study. The only difference was that in the one study, in the first one, it was integrated the food, the MCTs, and the second one, it was added to the oil, uh, added above the food. Um, one also has to say it looks like that the effect on the first, in the first trial is probably partially being explained uh, to be partially better by the f actually the oil being integrated in the food because you just already get a, a better um, absorption um, of the MCTs. And now, uh, again, just recently published uh, another study where we said, okay, now we use the very bad dogs. Now we want to have a, a cohort of dogs which um, doesn't have cluster seizures because we do know that dogs with cluster seizures, um, um, so a high seizure density, have a high uh, risk of not um, responding to therapy adequately, right? And so we wanted to look at dogs which don't have cluster seizures, and we wanted to look in the field. So when now people are using us as a vet in the field, what is it then, right? And interestingly, again, in, in this study, we found that there was a 30% a, a, a decrease. So again, we could replicate that uh, also here some dogs responded very well, but an overall very well response. So we have now three studies where we could show that there, might, uh, there, there is quite a good evidence that MCTs um, can reduce seizure frequency uh, when, when added to the diet. And um, it obviously is always like, because idiopathic epilepsy is not one disease. Remember my first slide about this. Um, so in some dogs, it responds very well, and others don't, like with, with um, drugs as well. So how does it work? Um, 
um, we earlier discussed about that you are giving a different um, energy source. And we do know, and I'm, I'm sure you, you might have uh, heard this uh, before, or that you know as older you get, you need to have a high, higher protein and rich diet and not so much sugary diet. Um, because your brain works better, and, and it's known that actually, and I, I when I started veterinary medicine, you know, people didn't know. You thought you always need sugar for the neurons to work well, but actually, uh, that's not the case. Um, it is um, uh, what has been shown is that if you on ketone bodies, the neurons are even more effective, right? And this could probably explain what I showed you earlier. And this is a slide where. Um, a PET scan where you see high activity is red and blue is, is low activity. So what actually happens during the, ep during the epileptic seizure, you will have a reddening of that activity, but be in between, so in between the seizure, it's actually a blue activity. So that's the area now being hypermetabolic. It's very nicely shown in this publication. So what we are thinking is that we are giving them different energy sources to make that brain uh, function work better in these hypermetabolic areas um, uh, which, which are more uh, um, uh, have an altered glucose metabolism. The, um, we also published um, a study where we have shown that uh, there is a change in mitochondrial function uh, when they are fed on the MCT diet. So there was a, you know, we, we, we did a um, metabolic screening approach and, and looked at a lot of factors which, which changed when the uh, dogs received the MCTs. And the really interesting thing, and, and T. Law, um, he's actually originally uh, from China, and he said, you know, Holger, this is really exciting news. I found C17. He came to my office and I said, wow, C17, why are you excited? I, I don't get it. And he said, Holger, this has to be de novo uh, um, lipogenesis. Genesis. So, because one of the things is, as you know, from the Krebs cycle and all your biochemistry uh, teaching, you you uh, you you either add in twos or you lose in twos, yeah, with your um, with your fatty acids. And if you suddenly have a set odd numbers, then it has to come from where? So it either comes from your diet, or it's de novo generated. And because we obviously compared to the two, um, it looked like that actually C17s. Uh, um, develop themselves and one of the idea was that you change your metabolism you get more alpha oxygenation and uh, we know um, that certain uh, C17s can then uh, um, actually get metabolized into tree heptanin and that was one of the ideas that which which people have shown is um, anti-seizure activity so that's another mechanism of action so it's not only a change in the um, metabolism um, you create that you give them another energy source but also that you might change your mitochondrial function and your uh, lipid metabolism the i find really exciting um, is that also certain decorative acids might have a direct effect on the glutamatergic um, activity. So as you m might know, that phenobarbital, bromide, and all these other ones, they all dampen down the activity, right? They go all in the GABA receptor. But we have no real treatment which is actually uh, decreasing the excitatory pathway. And um, if it's really true that there are certain uh, C10s, the decanoic acids, which have a direct effect on the AMPA receptor, that could also explain some of the activity, right? And um, and that also might, what I said earlier, every little help. So it could be that certain C10s um, uh, modify at least this, this, uh, this receptor and could be one of the explanations um, why uh, they might respond better when the MCTs are added to uh, a dog which already is treated with phenobarbital. And this is um, a, a little slide here uh, which uh, summarizes um, uh, the two. Um, so you have on the, on the left-hand side the glutamatergic uh, activity and on the right-hand side the GABAergic. And you can see obviously where phenobarbital is measuring and then our idea is that actually now there might be some NMDA. So you are working on both pathways and that could explain uh, that it's uh, an improvement in, in activity. 
So again, you see my, my talk comes in cycles, it comes always back to the same thing. Um, and I, I uh, have some evidence also for, for the cognition, which I will mention, but I can't show you a slide yet because we just uh, submitted it. Um, um, but we found that also the cognition improved actually in dogs when their MCT was fat. So dogs with epilepsy, which had a decreased uh, uh, cognitive ability, also improved their cognition when MCTs were added to the diet. And then interestingly, as higher the uh, hydroxybutyrate level was, as better the um, uh, improvement in cognition. So very similar to the aging research. So you see there's where the first uh, full cycle is coming. The other thing what was really exciting, and, and this is I told you earlier when we showed you the paper from Taya Jochen um, from Helsinki, she had obviously... Um, uh, you know, showed that they have a change in their impulsivity control. And we, when we compared our data, we also found that um, our dogs on this trial um, had that. And MCT Im looked like actually improving this impulsivity and the changing behavior. Um, interesting as well, it didn't look to correlate with seizure control. So it was some dogs which had a better behavior profile um, and uh, better seizure control, but some dogs had um, uh, either or. Yeah? And the other thing is that it also had some anxiolytic properties. So people felt that the dogs had, um, and we could actually replicate this again, this is as submitted in the other study, where we showed that the quality of life improved and that the dogs were less sedated and, and less ataxic uh, when that. So this could give you a little bit of a, an overview of um, all the uh, things you can do with a diet and what we know at the moment. I, I think what is really important when you, when you look at management option, when you look at uh, treating an epileptic patient, that you individualize your management. So in the past, when I started, like I said, with beauty, you know, I totally ignored that he had gastrointestinal signs. Nowadays, when I get an owner and he comes to my clinic, I, you know, I have a, um, and some of my nutrition friends will be proud of me, I have an, an, a nutrition questionnaire where I, you know, ask them exactly what diet are they on, do they have any problems with that, um, you know, how is the stool looking and so on. So I, I look at that factor, I look if they have changes in behavior, is there changes in cognition, are there any factors which actually could trigger, and, and like I said, I don't have too much time to talk about this, but we found that around half of the owners can actually predict a seizure half an hour before. So, and some of them can even say, um, hey, if, if that happens, then they might have a seizure. And stress plays a really important factor in that. So you ask them, you know, is, is there a factor? And then, obviously, when you manage them, you can look at the diet, you can look and, uh, at, the, at the drug treatment, you can look at reducing the trigger factors, you can reduce the stress factors, and, and obviously also think about the owner, what they can cope with, um, so you get the whole uh, quality of life package. Because it's, it's nothing worse than, obviously, um, having a, a dog which you have totally drugged up, but you have forgotten the owner, right? Because you have to take the owner on the journey that they are full in support, and they come as a package, and if they're both happy, um, then obviously you made a difference. I would everyone for listening to this talk. I hope you learned a little bit about diets, and I, um, it's quite exciting. Uh, when I first gave a presentation about this topic, I had only one study, and people uh, questioned this result, obviously, which is normal, because uh, how can a diet change this? We are doing some really exciting work on this field at the moment. If you want to follow us, we have a little Facebook page. It's really exciting, the gut-brain axis. Um, there's a lot going on. Um, the gut might be a mirror of the brain, and there's a vagal nerve which, which communicates between. Um, I think um, just giving pills is, is not enough for this disease. Um, just obviously removing uh, triggers, just giving diet is the same thing. I think you need to look at, at, at the multimodal approach, and I think I hope uh, you learned this today. So thank you for listening, and I hope to see you uh, um, uh, at one stage in person.